Hello again, I thought I'd make a video of this uh, a project I, I decided to work on. This is a piece of rusty box metal with one side removed so that I could add in uh, this is a momentary foot switch so it's a simple toggle switch um, this is my DSPIC33 development board now this microcontroller DSPIC33 EP256MU806 includes USB device and USB host. Now I previously did a video where I just to test the device functionality and test that this circuitry was all right. I uh, used microchips MLA, the microchip libraries for applications. They have an example keyboard project there. It's a very simple project. So I compiled that project and flashed it into this device just to check the functionality just to test it now at the time I joked that nobody would ever need a one key keyboard but I've actually thought of a reason to have a one key keyboard so this is for another project obviously but I thought of this so I thought well may as well do this for why not so this is as in the last example of the one key of the test keyboard this is just um, the switch is connected between ground and pin D0 and there's a pull up resistor underneath here pulling it to 3v3 so pin D0 is always at a high voltage 3v3 until somebody presses the foot switch in which case it goes, gets pulled to ground I'm going to program it with pick kit 3 and I'm going to power it with USB Walmart uh, like a, a wall plug for the minute um, but I should show you my use case my use case is when I'm learning sorry when I'm learning music I use audacity bring in the piece of music and select a phrase that I want to learn now obviously this isn't music so I'm not going to violate copyright this is a, a recording of a horse farting so and it's actually a light vo a low volume because it's quite difficult to record a horse farting so select the phrase that you're interested in and press the space bar and it plays that section now I can press the space bar and then press it again to stop the playback or I can press shift and space bar and it will loop that section and play the phrase over and over now that's great I use uh, a trackball which is wireless so I can put that anywhere close at hand but the space bar on the laptop can be quite awkward to reach when you've got your hands full of musical instrument so I thought why don't we make that one key keyboard and press the space bar or send the space bar out to the host computer when we press that. So that's the project. As simple as that. So back to square one, I'm going to create this project. I have a habit of losing projects, so I'm going to create this in in the actual library of code that I use. So I created this library and in that library is our, like as well as the API functions for various things I've got a, a directory full of examples and projects. So this might be a useful project to have and we'll, we'll just create it and um, have it so we can refer back to it if need be and it tests the functionality of the um, USB keyboard that I've added now the USB keyboard stuff that I've added I keep the USB keyboard is it uses microchips MLA implementation of the USB protocol stack so, um, am I in the right place? I am in the right place. So, 
So it uses microchips stack. For the protocol, for the USB protocol, because to make, for me to write that would be a ridiculous amount of effort. Um, so why reinvent the wheel? Um, so I've just created an API to interface to their MLA code. So if I go into USB, now I like a source directory and we need a main function and historically I just put that in main.c and we need a libby soup config header file to have various switches to turn on and off functionality that we need in this library. This library contains a lot of code, so we don't want all that code, we just want bits of it. And that's it, we need those two files. So and if I go and add, there's nothing in the source at the minute, so if we add code from where we've just checked out, temp, If we add that directory, now normally I just remove both the documentation and the examples directory, but remove it from the project. But since my project is now down in examples, I'm going to have to remove all of these main files because these example mains will confuse the compiler when it, it's looking for a main function and it finds any number of them. And we also need to remove all these projects. I must do a video on that USB X pad. I must check the status of it. I haven't worked on it for a while. Um, so that's our main. And that's our config file. So I'm going to use serial logging. So I want to, there's a switch. So I've defined that to turn on logging in this file and I need a tag to mark um, one key keyboard. So all the logging coming from this file will be tagged with that okay key. And then we just need to hash include lib e soup config dot h and we need a main function. Now our library We want to protect this with this, so it's only included once. It's kind of a standard pattern. Now, 
we need a board file it's usually the last thing I include but I need a board file to define the, the, the actual hardware that we're we're compiling this into now this is my standard DSPEC 33 board it's not uh, sometimes I change use this as the, the template and add a, a different board with different functionality but this is our standard board file and we also need to define um, a clock frequency now the crystal on the device is a 16 um, 16 megahertz crystal but the, the, the microcontroller has um, phase lock loop to increase that or to whatever so we're going to check I usually go with 60 megahertz 60 megahertz is kind of like the max now just go with that um, so that's a start defining the hardware that we're going into and the clock frequency we want to run it at and we've got a main function and to test this out we want to actually include because we're going to use logging serial log dot h and this probably won't compile because we have to set up the paths for the compiler to search for include files which is in their pre-processing and we want our source directory which is where we put the main and the um, libesubconfig.h but we also need to go up directory to get our libesub relative so when we include libesub slash log or slash serial log that it knows it goes to that directory to pull it in which is just above this one as because of the way I'm doing this and that builds so the first thing to do would be to um, I usually have a return code and sometimes I check it sometimes I don't I suppose if We'll initialize the the library and then the la the only thing then is is in the main loop we have to just do the tasks. just to test this is working we could log something um, I have power try and
And then P-Lab X is a bit sensitive about pick kit 3s. I don't know whether it's MP-Lab X or the kit pit 3. Try this again. Right, that worked. So now, if I there's a the thing. never set my configuration for serial logging in the library so we want to define we want to use the system UART and one of the parameters it needs is is a TX buffer size. So we just set it to 512, nice round number. Um, and we want to enable serial logging. Now the, the three pin connector on the on the actual development board because of the, the the functionality of this microchip you can you 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 can select what pin is connected to what peripheral so you can set the serial the UART to a serial output to one pin or another pin so you can actually have this as either the three pins as ground or XTX obviously you can't reprogram the ground connection on the fly it's it's hardwired so you're either ground rx tx or ground tx rx and i usually go with ground rx tx i'm using an rs uh, a raspberry pi serial logging cable so i mean you can so i can connect it any way i want but i always just remember the colors in that order and we want a, a log level so we'll go for the We'll go for everything and go for a debug and all the speed and I usually go for 19k too so if we Hopefully that compiles. Now that pulls in functionality from the library now getting compiled into the project. So now OKK main entering main loop. So that's the first part of our Um, project sort of thing we now need because we're looking at a pin which is changing we want 
I want GPIO and I want change notification because we're monitoring a pin usually when I, I create these things I don't put anything in the main loop apart from the tasks of the library and it's the library's responsibility to let me know there's a change in a pin um, so to do that we need to GPIO set and our pin is already zero it's an input pin And we also need a function to well let's set up a change notification on that pin so so we register a handler for that and pin rd0 I don't know why it's not happy with that line but we need a uh, we need this function now, rd0. Um, and that takes a GPIO pin. And we log. This has to be rd0, it's the only then call in this function and we'll just print out its value with um, GPIO now in order for all that to work we have to add that functionality to the configuration file so we're actually building it in um, so we hash so if we weren't using any change notification we wouldn't include change so we're enabling that switch enables that section of code but we also need to define how many pins we're going to be monitoring so we'll say a four for the sake of argument given that there's space for four switches so now So now we've reprogrammed that. If I press this switch, now press the button twice there, and as you can see, we got a lot more than two changes. And the change notification function got called a number of times. So we have to debounce that switch when. when you can check that out online on the internet, um, debouncing a switch. You can use, 
you can use an RC circuit um, or you can actually do it with hardware there's a max maximum chip I can't remember the, no the number I actually used it on the, the mower project but we'll do this in software so instead of reacting to this change notification we will debounce with a timer um, so we'll have Hundred and fifty microseconds. We better say this is microseconds. So we'll we'll create a timer and um, and because we're going to start the timer in this change notification function, and we're going to probably get cancel or clear it in an expiry function. We'll have to make it our timer. static to the file so that's our bounce timer and we may as well have our request we've got a timer request and make it global in the file as well so we only have to We can only we only have to set it up. It'll always be the same time we're setting for this 150 milliseconds, or sorry, microseconds. So we'll just set up the timer once, the structure once. So if we say microseconds debounce duration you as um now the the type of timer we're going to use a single expiry The actual application library contains repeat timers, stopwatch timers, but we just want one shot. And data. This is in a, in a Unix type structure for a timer. We'll just set it to zero and the last thing we want is an expiry function. So we've set all that structure up in main and then we can start the timer in because it's a static to the file, we can actually, it's, we're never gonna change these values. We're always gonna use 150 micros or, yeah, microseconds, single shot expiry and call this, this expiry function. So we should actually stick it up here. So um, 
um, it takes a timer ID and the union. This that timeout function gets past this data element, and we're just pressing zero. We're not. We're just. We're not really using that parameter as such. So, but it's still passed to the function. It will just get past zero. So. All this now function does Now because we're using microseconds, we're going to need a hardware timer. Actually I never enabled software timers and I never included So start a timer and we just pass in the address of the request. And the only thing I didn't do is initialize that. It's kind of a pattern I used that. When a timer ID hasn't been created, it's just set to bad timer ID, or DAB as the case may be. So back to our configuration file, we have to define hardware timers. And because th there's nothing to add to that, because the, the hardware timers is actually implemented by the silicon. So every device will have a different number of timers. So if it just if that compiles, just check that over. We haven't actually done any bounce in there. We haven't. What the bounce is going to do is say. We need to keep track of port D. So if we Static to the file, and we're gonna we're just gonna read port D. So we have that value stored. Now, if we come into the debounce timer thing, if Port D. How do I get into caps locks? If port D and if bit zero of port D is not equal to 
Now this is our stored value. So this is what we think port D should be. So, um, what switch zero is actually what port D zero, pin D zero actually is, is going to be. So if it's changed, basically. And one thing we want to do in here, because the timer has expired, we're going to set it back to bad timer ID. And it has changed, but we want to now update port D. And read the value back of what it currently is. So. If I program that. So now we're getting zero and one. So we've debounced our chip. I'm sure there's probably our or debounced our switch. I'm sure there's probably um we should actually probably do new port D. And read back the whole of port D. And if that is not equal to new, so if that's not equal to the f bit zero of the new port. Sure, it makes a difference, but we'll go with that just in case there's a change between when I read the value of the port and what the port was. But if that was the case, so we're well on the way here now to get the difference between a long press. I want to be the a long press with my foot is shift space. And a short press is just a single space. And to do that, I want to time it. So I'm going to use software timers. Now in software timers, we're going to have to include that in the project. And because this is a software thing, unlike hardware timers, 
Um, there's a switch or a parameter set, the number of software timers. And I think we only need one, but I don't even actually think we need any, to be honest. But we'll go with five. It's just And we'll go at five millisecond tick. So the way the software timers works is, is the software timer module grabs one hardware timer and sets up a timer, a hardware timer of that duration. And every time that, that timer expires, it then increases a count of system ticks. And there's actually another define here, and this is what I'm gonna actually use to define things. There is, there are, stopwatch timers in the API but that's not really that, that's overkill um, don't know what the thing did there so every time there's a five millisecond count the system increases a, a tick counter And if I include this define, that enables an API call that will give me that back. So I'm going to time how long a key is pressed with just by connect by counting five millisecond tick. So what we want to do here is if Why did I put a percentage there? We're going to bitwise on that. Newport D. Don't know why it's not happy with that. We want the negation of that. So when the pin goes to zero, when the switch is pressed, we want to get the system ticks. Now that's a uint 16 from memory and And we're going to have to make it static because the first time round this function, this function is going to get called when the debounce, when the switch gets pressed and when it's released. So when the switch gets pressed, it goes to zero. We want pull in the, ver the number of system ticks. And hold that value. Otherwise, it's the switch has gone back to one, and we just now need the difference. So
check underscore ms Sorry. Memory got the better of me. Right. So now if I press this That's, I'm printing out two, I should only print out one, so we'll only go. So when it goes back to one, we'll print out the ticks. There's no point in printing out the ticks when we're gone. So now, so that's 183 5 millisecond ticks. So that's the difference in a short and a long. So the last bit of functionality we need is. At this part of the code where it's gone back to one, we've taken a foot off, off the switch. We want to say if ticks is greater than I don't know. What will we say? Twenty five was a short, let's say a hundred. So that's a long and a short press. So the last thing we need to do, you'll be glad to hear, is comms slash USB keyboard USB keyboard.h is the API and the code might not be in great there's a switch we need to enable it so if we go to config.h the last thing we need is 
to define that API functionality. And that's our API function. Now I've played about with this and we'll ignore the result because I'm in that frame of mind. Just bang this together quickly. The value for a spacebar is 44. Now this isn't ASCII. Um, what a keyboard transmits is not ASCII it's, it's, or anything. It, it, I'm not sure what the coding is. So basically the API function give, accepts a key number and then whether shift is pressed or not because um, I just banged this it, API together very quickly and an API will grow as you, as you need functionality and add functionality but um, um, So I, I'm, I'm the API in this library was just created for this for the minute I mean if, if things grow then functionality gets bundled more into it more now we're back to adding in USB now USB.h is microchips MLA code. So the microchip library for we'll go absolute here and I'm on running on a Linux system and microchip puts the MLA into slash opt. Is it framework? USB.h, I know where this is. Framework USB ink. Should have guessed that. Now the USB down in that keyboard in the keyboard API that this gets a bit messy. Um, no. The, the MLA requires two header files, system.h and USB config.h. So we're going to have to add this directory, this keyboard directory, into our project properties as another location for a, header files on the path. It's a bit messy, but Microchip expects them to be in the path, and I, it's the best, well, to me, the best location is out of the way. Um, so down in comms USB keyboard so we add that directory to the path so our path is getting a bit messy at this stage now the last thing is we're using 
microchips MLA is implementation of the USB protocol. So I have a script here and a readme that sets up. So we need three files, three header files. And those files are all up in the MLA directory. So we're linking them in to this location. So now, if I'd have done that at the start, they would have been pulled in. But since I didn't, we need to add them. So they're just symbolic links into this. So device, device head and device hal. USB device local. I think I failed again. To. For the minute, I'm just going to pull that in here. I have to tidy that up. I'm not sure what's in that header file. I never noticed that header file before. Right. So back to our thing. We think we're working, so I'm gonna ah, exit Kermit. And instead of powering this, our board off a wall charger plug we're going to plug it into our computer and there's our keyboard I've changed the device descriptors um, I've used microchip have a vendor ID and product ID. I haven't messed with those at all. I've just left those the way they are. Obviously, I don't have a, a my own vendor ID. So now if I press, so a short press starts, short press starts, short press stops, long press, loops obviously and I can stop that so that's our project I'll stop there because that was a lot longer than I thought it's not much code to be honest I mean it's only a few little bits it's it's three functions a bounce expiry uh, change notification handler and that's it the main loop just sets up a few bits of data and then just runs the tasks 
Um, I'll leave it there. Thanks a million for watching.